Boy, and, and of course, we thank you for that update. I appreciate that. I had not heard anything in a couple of three days, so praise the Lord for that. I don't know if we got two or three men that would volunteer. Peggy, you got that outline, honey? And uh, if you would, if, if a couple of guys would just go back there and volunteer to pass them out. Somebody, everybody take a section, just maybe three of you, and that'll do it. So we'll get that out. So do be praying for Brother Greg. Surgery could be as early as Wednesday, maybe sooner, okay? Any other prayer request? Anyone? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh my. All right, Bob, thank you so much for that. And um, I appreciate Bob, by the way, being here for security and uh, chat with him earlier. But uh, pray for his family. This is, is this your brother? No, my cousin. Your cousin, okay, cousin. I missed that part. And uh, they live up near Buffalo. Are you from Buffalo originally? How about that? Um, we hope to go up there next summer. We want to see Niagara Falls. Never made that trip. We're about ten, minutes. ten minutes from Niagara Falls. How about that? That's pretty incredible. But their family, due to a fire, they've lost their home, their business, and really uh, very impactful. So please remember this dear family in prayer. Anybody in this section, prayer requests? Anyone? Okay, over here. All right, good. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Percy Wallace, good to see you this morning. And um, have you got a surgery or anything coming up very soon? Okay. All right. It's kind of the waiting game and through the VA and so forth. And, uh, but uh, uh, please, please be praying, okay? Uh, my mind's blank now. Um, who, who's at the VA? The, oh, Doug Lilly. Remember Doug Lilly in prayer. Got I got one or two. I, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, Doug Lilly had a, a procedure this week, uh, repaired a heart valve and received a stent. So remember him in prayer a, as well. Okay. All right. Hey, let's go to Lord in prayer and try and remember these requests together. Okay. Mike Marshall, uh, dear brother, would you open us in prayer this morning, please?
Amen. Bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. One birthday, Miss Sheila Quinn. I don't see uh, the Quinns here this morning. And Miss Peggy got up and fixed some cookies for them. But uh, happy birthday to Sheila. Hers is coming up on the 3rd. Well, look at there. Got an anniversary for a very special little couple. <laughs> Peggy and I will be celebrating tomorrow our 47th anniversary. Gary, I, I didn't think she'd stay with me this long. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I just, uh, yeah. Well, you know, we got a really, really good pair of earplugs. And um, so it helps a lot. And so she, <laughs> if she's heard enough, she just sticks them in, you know, then headphones. <laughs> and it helps a lot that I've moved out to the utility building. That's been a real blessing to her. But uh, no, i tell you what, I love her more today than I did the day that we said I do to one another. And I praise the Lord for a Christian wife, Christian companion, uh, the fun, the memories, and and, and the great times, and what a joy, what a privilege to have worked together in the same place for 45 years, and uh, obviously Brother Dan enlightened me how to have a successful marriage, and he said, you both need to own your own vehicle, and so she's got her little car, and I got my little truck, and, and uh, I'm on time sometimes, and she's on time other times. But uh, anyway, I love you, honey, and we're thankful for the good years. We're going to leave after church today, and we're going to take just a, a two-day, two-night little trip, just not very far away. And uh, is it Motel 6, Peggy, and Mount Olive? Uh, <laughs> but uh, I try to get her to go camping all the time. She doesn't want to camp. And, uh, and I, I'm always talking about buying a little camper, something, one of these little cute things, you know, the kind of round top, you know, Lewis, and, and just something simple, not real high dollar, and pull that little thing around. And I said, what I want to do is when I retire, we've got family in Florida and in Georgia and uh, uh, Texas and Tennessee and Kentucky and Connecticut, and then we've got lots of friends Last count was two, maybe three. But we've got lots of friends that I feel like we could go and we could borrow their water and electricity and just park that little car. But she's not in for it. Her, her idea of roughing it is Motel 6. So she's not going, we're not going to camp, I reckon. But uh, anyway, uh, so uh, I told her, I said, we ought to rent one of those things. We ought to rent one. And give it a try and just see if you would like it. And if I really do like it, I think I do, but I, I who knows? Yeah, he, I mean, all I got to do is buy an $88,000 pickup truck to pull it. <laughs> I can borrow it free, right? Amen. Thank you for that offer, brother. And I don't know if you've seen Gary and Norma's uh, rig or not, but I can tell you something. Uh, I could move in that bad boy. It is all right. By the time they get through pushing all those walls out, uh, they, they've, got, uh, they've got space, I'm telling you. And if I had one of those deals, that's kind of like what I'd really like to have. It's, it is roomy. It is roomy. Mike. 22 years. Let's hear it from Mike and Tracy. Praise the Lord. Hot 26. Tracy, we want to congratulate you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 26 and counting. Hey, let me ask you this. Have I missed... Hey, did you give them some cookies? Okay. Am I missing anybody? Have we missed anybody? Your anniversary or birthday in the last uh, 30 days. Did we miss anybody? All right. Miss anybody? In the last 60 days. All right, we've done real well. Uh, James, we missed you, didn't we? Were you out of town? What's the deal? Huh? James and Hope, 50 years of marriage. Congratulations, couple. And amen. We, uh, I told Peggy, I said, honey, just in case we missed anybody, Fix some cookies, and uh, we don't need them. Uh, you know, I, I'm diabetic, and 
she's not diabetic, but she doesn't need them either. So anyway, there we are. We had a couple extra today. Hey, amen. Yeah, your take. I got another taker here, Peggy. <laughs> Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Man, this is an amazing chapter. We've already been in it a couple of weeks, and it's a long chapter, and so it takes a while to get through these chapters that have 40 plus verses, but it has so many different parts to it and different events. And uh, uh, Marcus uh, McCombs has helped me out this morning and he's got something. Are you going to stay in here a few minutes then? Are you? Linda Cash, they took her to the hospital last night. I forgot to mention that. And I heard it last night, but uh, uh, remember, Linda, and put her on your prayer sheet, if you will, please. Linda Cash. Very good. So, uh, again, an outstanding, amazing uh, chapter. And I'm backtracking just a little bit, but I won't stay there long. And so look in verse 8, if you will, please, in chapter 19, the book of Acts. The history book of the church and how it's established. The Bible says, And he went into the synagogue and he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading. I'm telling you something, it doesn't say this, and the Word of God would not say this, I guess, but I believe he begged the people. He begged the people to accept the truth. Paul had such a burden for his people, he was a Jew. But he didn't stop with the Jews. As we well know, he went to the Gentiles. He was a soul winner. He loved people. And when he entered there, let me tell you something. I don't believe he went in there arrogantly. I don't ever believe that. Now, I may get to heaven, and I may find out differently. I don't think he was arrogant. I think he went in with a burden. He went in with a passion. And he was, and the Bible says it, no less than four times about Paul that he went in and he spoke how? Boldly. Boldly. I'm running just a little dry today, okay? So forgive me there. I don't know if Paul wrote Hebrews or not. It, it does tend to remind you of Pauline writings. And a lot of people try to give him credit that he wrote the book of uh, Hebrews. But I know this, that that term boldly is used in the book of Hebrews. Uh, forgive me, I forget what chapter it is. I want to say it's in chapter 9. It may be in chapter 10. But what is that word boldly being used in the book of Hebrews in relationship to? Anybody remember? Come boldly, it says, to where? To the throne of grace. Come boldly. Come boldly. And that's another little indication that kind of makes me think it was Paul. Uh, you, you can tell the books of Paul because he almost always introduces himself. And he often introduces himself as a what? He was a, and I think of somebody that is this, has a towel over their arm. A servant. A servant. A servant of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the Lord wants us to be. A servant. A faithful servant. Humbled, ready to be used, ready to perform whatever He calls or initiates us to do and how important that that is. And so, um, uh, he, uh, he spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the things of God. And when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, man alive, he decided that's it. I, I don't have to sit here and listen to all this negativism I don't have to put up with this, uh, with all these critics. I've told you plainly. I've told you lovingly. I've told you convincingly. 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Messiah you've been waiting on. And here we come and we tell you and then you don't want to believe it. What you don't want to believe is you don't, it's not me you're rejecting. It's God Almighty you're rejecting. By the way, when you're out witnessing, you're out soul winning, you're talking to somebody about Jesus, don't you feel like the, de the dejected one? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the truth and the gospel and they're rejecting God and His precious gift. You shouldn't feel offended about it. Um, Jesus Himself was rejected. And so we're in good company. And we just need to remind ourselves of that and not get downhearted and discouraged. And so it says He departed from them and He separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of Tyrrhenius. We touched on that last week. That was a fine little school. And you know something was great happening there because he spent how long in that little school educating and, and, and helping them understand the things of God that God had taught him. He spent two years. Paul didn't park anywhere too long. It was most unusual for him to stay in Corinth. We studied just a few weeks ago. Anybody remember how long he stayed in Corinth? Not as long as he did in Ephesus. He was in Ephesus for two and a half years. But he stayed in Corinth. Anybody remember? Eighteen months, two, uh, a year and a half. That's a long spell. And now here he's come to Ephesus and two years of his ministry is there. And then three months in every Saturday in the synagogue. And so the time is building up. And uh, he is spending a lot of his time, a lot of his life. And, uh, but isn't it a beautiful statement what's said in verse 10? And this continued by the space of two years, so that they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both the Jews and the Gentiles. Now for the Holy Spirit to inspire Luke to say, everybody heard the gospel in that region is an impressive thing. That is a very impressive thing. And why? Here's a little school with probably a pretty good enrollment, and then they would go through the schooling, graduate, go on and go to the highways and hedges and they'd be witnesses. Maybe they didn't become full-time evangelists. They might not have become pastors, but you know what they became? They became soul winners. And the gospel was heard. And then here comes another wave. It was a little Bible institute. It was a little Christian school, a little Christian college. And, uh, and I say little, I, I, they don't tell us the numbers. Verse 11, and God wrought special miracles, how? By the hands of Paul. Paul was an anointed man. And I'm not saying he was better than all the other apostles, but the truth of the matter is, somehow or another, he and Peter and John and, and one or two others, but they were on another level, it seems like. The other apostles were good men. They were godly men. They were faithful men. They died for the cause of Christ as we understand it. But there was just some things about Paul. When Jesus said in Acts chapter 9, he told Ananias, he said, I want you to go to a place called the street called Straight, and you're going to find a fellow. His name is Saul. Saul of Tarsus and Ananias said, uh-oh, I've heard of that boy. And he's not a nice fella. In fact, he's a bad dude. In fact, among the Jews and everything I read among the Jewish literature, he is public enemy number one. And, and, and Lord, I, I, I don't even want that address. <laughs> but Ananias went. I get tickled. God's got a sense of humor. You know that. Uh, I laugh about God's sense of humor all the time. We'll learn something in just a few minutes uh, about it when, when we hear about these seven sons of scurvy and, and, and the, the demon 
the evil spirit inside this man says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> and then we'll find out what happened to that crowd that tried to cast that demon out. But uh, Jesus got a sense of humor. I, I can tell you an illustration of a sense of humor that God has got. Look at the animal kingdom. Just look at the animal kingdom. Now, I'm a fan of zoos, okay? I like going to zoos. I've been to Overton Park Zoo. I've been to uh, the, the zoo in Atlanta. I've been in the zoo um, uh, in Birmingham area. In, no, not Birmingham, Memphis, Tennessee, Overton Park. I'm trying to think. I've been to the uh, National Zoo in Washington, D.C. I've been to about five zoos and then some little places that they have a lot of animals. And I just always am amazed of the shape and form and the ugliness and the humorous look. How about an orangutan? Have you ever seen an orangutan in person? Now I'm telling you what. I mean, he, he, he looks like Buddha sitting there. I mean, he really does. Just a big old belly and he's kind of reddish brown. And, and he always had this look like, Just like <laughs> But hey, I'm just a just a funny, funny character. And then the gorilla himself. We'd go to that Overton Park. Peggy and I used to take a crowd over to Overton Park, Memphis, Tennessee, and we would go to the amusement park over there called uh, Liberty Land. Liberty Land. And uh, it was just a small scale thing, but it had roller coasters. We had fun. Then we'd go to the zoo. And they had those gorillas in behind this thick, I assumed it was thick, thick, thick glass. And I'm telling you, those gorillas were a lot smarter than what you think, and they got a kick out of this. But people would want to walk up there close to that glass and look at those things as if you couldn't see them 10 feet back. But you'd walk up close to it, and that gorilla would kind of come over there, and, he'd, and then he'd turn his back to them. And everybody's pecking on the window, wanting the, the gorilla to turn around, and he'd go, whoo! He'd slap that glass wall, and we were not inches from it then. We were miles from it, and it just scared you to death. It was just, it was funny. But uh, you think about different creatures. I, 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 I think about a toucan. That poor bird looks like he's got four pounds of beak in front of him. Now, God, what were you thinking? I mean, you know, it just, it, it's just something. An anteater. Have you ever seen an anteater? They got this long snout, and they just, and they'll run it up the top of those anthills in Africa and, and in South America. And you ought to see some of the anthills in South America. They, hey, I'm telling you something, they get as tall as going up to the second level here. They'd build those things, and then they'd abandon them and go build another. And uh, just amazing. But there are ant eaters in that region, and there's plenty of food, I can assure you. But God's got a sense of humor. And uh, so it, it's just interesting. But here in verse 11, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And he blessed the Apostle Paul to be able to touch and heal. We've already learned of several people. Paul himself was bitten by a viper. And it was just really as if it didn't phase him at all. He was left for dead. He was stoned on an occasion. And, uh, and he survived that wonderfully. God touched him. God healed him. And then he goes on to say in verse 12, look there with me, so that these miracles that he was able to wrought, so that his body were brought unto the sick with handkerchiefs and, anchor, uh, and aprons and and they would, they would let Paul touch this. Someone said this apron, this apron was an apron that he wore when he built tents. And the whole idea of the apron is that it was to hold his garments back. It wouldn't get in the way when he's stitching and sewing and making and cutting uh, material to make these tents. And there were lots of scraps and Paul would touch these napkins and these cloths and perhaps formerly garments of his, of his own and then the apron. And people would take that 
and take it to a friend, a parent, or someone that was sick. And the very touching of that garment would bring healing to those people. Now, you've heard of it. I have. How many of you have ever heard of an evangelist offering to send a piece of cloth, a handkerchief that has been anointed and prayed over, and we're praying that God will take? That's where they get this. That's where they get that. Now, I, I'm not into that. I, 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 uh, look, uh, I may be a preacher of the gospel. I may try to expound upon the absolute truth and inerrancy and the faithfulness of the Word of God, but I would never try to impose upon people to believe for one moment that that handkerchief, that napkin, is going to bring healing to them. Notice verse 10 again. Who wrought and initiated these miracles? God did. God did. Not a man. Not Paul. God did it. And if God is in it, then it could happen. In one passage we've already studied, the very passing of Peter and the shadow cast upon sick were healed. When there was a lady who had an issue of blood, what did she do? And she reached out and touched who and what? The garment of Jesus. And what happened? She was instantly healed. Now that's the similarity that we're looking at right here in this passage. They're parallel. And when Jesus resurrected from the dead, what happened all over that graveyard? People rose from the dead. Can you imagine sitting in the house? You got a big glass of tea in front of you. And you look up and here comes cuz. We buried him six weeks ago. <laughs> I, I, that, that would just kind of interrupt the day there just a little bit. Brother, what are you doing here? <laughs> Where did you come from? Man, I don't know. I mean, I didn't know nothing going on. And all of a sudden the ground shook, I guess. And my grave threw open or my, that little stone rolled away on my covering, and I'm out of here, and I came to the first place that I could recall that I had family, and here I am. That happened again and again and again and again at the resurrection of our Savior. Let me tell you something. We serve the one, the only, almighty, great, and powerful God. There's not but one. And there was a lot of people in this region. And I'm going to jump on down here to it because I'm running out of time. And you can read the rest of these things yourself if you like a little later on. Look in verse 23. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Now let me tell you, when, when Paul showed up in the town, there was always a stir. And uh, he, had a, he had a strong and bold message. Now look at verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Now I'm telling you what, this old boy had a lucrative business. And there was this goddess named Diana Brother Marcus, if you'd like to throw it up there, you can do this. Here is a description, a picture of the temple of Diana. It was also a temple of yet another guard, uh, a god. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I can't remember. Athea. Uh, I forget exactly. What was it? Artemis. Artemis. Artemis okay. And so it, was, it served a dual purpose. Funds must have been tight, and they said, we'll do one temple, two gods. What do you say about that? They come cheap, you know. But this was the temple of Dinah, or Diana. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, I read a, I read a uh, story this week about this, and she, she rode a meteorite to earth. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Only a God could do that. 
she rode a meteorite and landed on earth. And it wasn't too far from Ephesus. And so they erected this temple and they began to worship her. And she was a vile, wicked, dirty little girl who she was. And it was all about lust. It was all about depravity. And it was just vile and wicked. And by the way, the city of Ephesus was a vile, wicked city. Paul comes to town. Paul goes to the synagogue. Paul teaches at, at, at this school in Tyrrhenia that had started it. And souls were being saved. Lives were being changed. And some of the lives being changed are the people who had formerly worshipped Diana. And so the sales were down. And Demetrius got real upset and he went to the rest of the guys that were the silversmith. He said, now look here, fellas. This guy, Paul, is ruining our business. If we're not careful, we're going to go bankrupt. We need to railroad this boy out of town. And uh, I know I skipped a lot of good stories there, but I just felt like let's get to that. I wanted to show this. And, and, all, and I appreciate you doing that, Marcus, your blessing. And uh, just, did you come up with the one, the Parthenon? Uh, uh, that is the original Parthenon in Athens, Greece. And um, I forget how many columns it was. It seems like it's 36, 37 columns. And I have been to the Parthenon. Not the one in Athens, Greece. I've been to the one in Nashville, Tennessee. How many of you have been there? Look at there. One, two. One, two, three. All right. We get that new bus in and we're going to load up and I'm going to take you on a field trip. And go to Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, some of you, I know you want to go to the Grand Ole Opry, but we're going to go to the Parthenon. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and uh, we might go eat some, uh, uh, some good catfish on 2nd Avenue South, Nashville, Tennessee, the Catfish House. And uh, it's all right. That's a remarkable building. That building is built to scale. Uh, it's just phenomenal how huge, how big, 40-something feet are the columns alone. Can you imagine them doing that? Can you imagine them doing that 800 years before the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth? By the way, the... Um, that temple, Diana, was destroyed on three different occasions. Uh, intentionally. I, I, you know, it could have been the people who felt like it was wrong, sinful, wicked, represented a lie, whatever, but it was destroyed on three different occasions. They kept building it back and building it back. And then the final one that they finally built, there it stands in its ruins today. But I thought you might be interested in that little archaeological history right there. And uh, look at all the rubble and everything around about it. It was a magnificent thing to behold. And Paul spent about three years in the vicinity of that temple and all those wicked temples around about. All right, let's have prayer. That's all we have time for today. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for the power of it the changing power of it. I thank you for the great truth that it represents. And dear Lord, thank you for the privilege of owning a copy and for us to be able to gather for a time together every week and, and fill our hearts and minds with the absolute truth. Thank you for the amazing life of Paul and Luke and Silas and uh, John Mark and Barnabas and those others who traveled with him and for the impact and the difference that they made. Dear Lord, it's, it's almost impossible to calculate how many people were saved, but you know every last one, and you know every last one by name, just like you know every one of us today that are living and breathing and serving, and you know us each by name. And what a peace, what a joy that is. Thank you for the opportunity to have the study of this great history book. We love you and we praise you. And we ask that you'd meet with us in a very special way this morning during the Sunday school or church hour. 
May you be honored and glorified. And we do pray for anyone who comes today, Lord, and for whatever the reason, they do not know you as their own personal Savior, and that today could be their day of salvation. Amen.